Hey friends, thanks so much for joining us. This is Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. I'm a clinical psychologist, leadership consultant, and a really big fan of you getting to fulfill your life purpose. I want you to get unstuck and unlock your potential relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and vocationally. Thanks for joining us and let's get started. Welcome to Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. And y'all, I have to brag on just this amazing encounter. So I was serving for Forward, uh, Christian Professional Women, shout out Diane Pattison. And I didn't have a mentor as the mentoring chair of Forward. And they're like, that's not a good thing. We should probably find her one. And so Diane reached out to a personal friend, Shanti Feldhahn, who became a mentor and a lifelong just hero Shiro in my life. I've audio listened to all her books. I'm not a big reader, unfortunately, but huge fan. Uh, she's written The Male Factor, which if you haven't read it, ladies in work, you need to read this book. And she wrote for men only and for women only and countless more. And she's with her book publisher this morning talking about the release of her newest book, which is what we will talk about today. Um, what is the topic, Shanti, that you would like to share about? I knew you were going to ask me that Shannon no actually it's still uh, some time away um, but the next research project and the next book is on sex and intimacy yes. and marriage which I think I must be nuts to talk about <laughs> that topic but it's not an easy one that's to gonna be it <laughs> we're still a long way away for the book actually coming out but yes that's so awesome. Okay. So what are key things? Uh, what I love about Shanti is that everything she does is empirically supported. It's data-driven research. So it's not antidotal opinion. Um, and she's an incredibly gifted speaker and communicator. Um, so the way that she weaves science and still makes it really fun and entertaining is truly a gift. So what are the things that people should know based on research that you have so far? Um, a couple teasers from the sex literature. A little behind the scenes stuff, yes. Actually, just to make sure that everybody doesn't run screaming away from this podcast. Or the opposite. You know, <laughs> well, from this one. <laughs> people are like, they're fine because this topic is so awkward. I literally, when I'm starting this, I could hardly say the word out loud like I'd be mean, like what's the book on sex like I had to like yeah so just so you guys know um what we were digging into with the research as as my husband says because um, my husband and I wrote the book with a co-author who's actually a therapist um one of the leading therapists in this area named Dr. Michael Seitzma, who I believe you met mm -hmm. when we hooked up a few months ago at AACC. Um, but as Jeff says, to put everybody at ease who's not a therapist, we are not talking about technique <laughs> in this book. Yes. <laughs> Just so you guys know, all of our research is designed to, the sort of the catchphrase is it's designed to uh, dig out and investigate the little things that make a big difference mm. in our lives, in our relationships. <clears throat> and in this case, we actually identified eight different factors that are really, really important that the average couple really, really doesn't know, actually. And the average marriage, people are, op are operating based on wrong information about each other or about intimacy itself. And whoa, like there is so much there that um, we're just not aware of. So for example, one of the things that um, causes issues, one of the big issues between marriage, married couples is a mismatch on um, frequency, okay. like where you have one person who has a higher desire than the other, very, very common. Um, and yet the assumption of usually the higher desire spouse is that, oh, well, my spouse just doesn't want it as much, or I'm not desirable to them or whatever, right? Like they make all these Attribute. sort of mm -hmm. attributions, exactly, mm -hmm. to use consultants to use counselor speak, um, but, but we do, right? Yeah. And one of the main things that we found that's actually getting in the way 
it has nothing to do with that. It's that there are physiologically two different types of desire. Yeah. And there's actually more types of desire than that, but two main ones that affect most people, like 90 something percent of people. And we think there's only one, like the average person thinks that what sex is, is that you feel like desire for your spouse, desire for sex, and you start getting aroused and you pursue it and you go after it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see in every Hollywood movie, right? Yes. Like you see the, the two beautiful people look at each other and pretty yeah. soon they're in bed. And that doesn't necessarily match the reality that so many people have. And they think a lot of, especially women, think there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And the husband often thinks something is wrong, <laughs> actually. Because it turns out there's a whole another there's a whole different kinds of desire. And in um, in some previous books, I called it assertive desire and receptive desire. It's mm -hmm. Michael, our co-author, Dr. Seitzma, calls it initiating desire and receptive desire. But that kind of stereotypical, you feel desire and you pursue it, that's initiating desire. Mm -hmm. but about half the population has receptive desire where it literally works revert in the reverse physiologically. Oh, like that for us. And that is, and that is tends to be more likely to be women, not always, but that tends to be more women. And for so for the average person with receptive desire, they have to decide to get engaged. Mm -hmm. They have to decide to start being intimate with their spouse. And then they start feeling aroused and then the desire shows up that their partner felt from the very beginning. And so that's where a lot of like stereotypically men, mm -hmm. they may not understand this concept of like, it's a decision and she's making the decision based on how she feels about you all day long. <laughs> Because she doesn't have that same sense of desire yet. Yes. It's not desire for intimacy yet. Yeah. And so that's the average couple. The we What we found, believe it or not, is that only 5% of couples do both the spouses mm -hmm. have initiating desire. Awesome. 95, 95 percent of couples, it's something, some other combination. Sure. And how many couples feel dissatisfaction in their relationship? Yeah. Thinking, you don't love me. You're not attracted to me. Yeah. And so it goes into the morale and then it's hard to pursue and initiate when you don't really feel desired by the other person. So what would that look like for the person that tends to not necessarily have that automatic libido? What does that choice look like for them? Do you think? So for the average person with receptive desire, because it is a choice mm -hmm. usually it's there's a couple different things. One is we we always we, I hesitate to say this because we're talking to the person who can make a choice. It's not it's we can never change what another person does, right? Mm -hmm. We can only change what we do. Mm -hmm. But there is a sort of mutual education here, thing here, which is one thing is to actually try to make sure that the spouse knows okay, this is me. Like, this is a different thing. This is not me saying you're not desirable. Right. This is me having a different physiology than you. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to the spouse, obviously, what they choose to do mm -hmm. with that. But I do honestly think that that education is actually kind of important. Um, so that the person with initiating, the spouse with initiating desire understands that. But then in terms of what we can do, like if someone who has receptive desire there's a couple things. One is um, actually having some sort of anticipation time. Like you get to know your spouse's pattern. Like, is your spouse the kind of person who wants sex every day or, you know, three times a week or once a week? And having that kind of in mind, if it's different from yours, where you're kind of keeping an eye on, okay, they're about every three days kind of person and it's been four or five. So I should probably have it in my mind to anticipate this. Mm -hmm. And then if you have that type of receptive desire, 
you can start, be, you can be thinking about it because that's one of the, the factors in receptive desire. You're just not thinking about it. And so it's like this surprise <laughs> where the average person with initiating desire is like, how could it be a surprise? Never be a surprise. <laughs> Are you not thinking about it all the time? <laughs> So that's an example of one thing that that makes a difference. We call that anticipation time, you know, and and that can also actually be something the spouse does as well. Like you just flirt, you know, and make little comments like, well, remember that tonight or whatever. Right. Um, the lead time. To yeah, the, lead time. And exactly. I love the quote that romance or foreplay starts in the kitchen. It's not yes. necessarily at the moment. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, another another thing that actually is um, really helpful for the receptive desire person to kind of keep in mind is even if this is out of the blue, mm -hmm. and even if they weren't thinking about it ahead of time, and it's like, you know, seems like, whoa, I wasn't thinking about it. There is in a, in a marriage of goodwill, right? Mm -hmm. In a marriage where there isn't, aren't, you know, big, deep relationship issues, because that's a kind of a different situation. Mm -hmm. If it's a generally a normal marriage with the normal stresses and um, that kind of thing, to be able to sort of decide to engage and recognize it'll be good for me in about in a few minutes. Like, like I'll start feeling this in a few minutes and recognize that's your physiology. Mm -hmm. That's it's the way that you're created. <laughs> this is, this is not that there's something wrong with you. And so that's a huge piece of it is kind of embracing how you're made mm -hmm. and working with it um, rather than against it. Because if you don't, then you get into all of these issues that are way more problematic for marriage. Like mm -hmm. you get into these patterns where people tend to, to dive into like a sexless marriage situation or it's just not happening very much and there's a loss of intimacy and a loss of connection and all sort of emotional issues that come with that and that could happen because of either spouse actually obviously that's not saying it's one person's fault or anything but just recognizing that with my pattern if this is you with my pattern that it's going to it's going to have to be a choice mm -hmm. Um, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I'm, I'm wired. Yeah. So internal permission for myself and for the other person. Yeah. I think shame can shut people down if they start thinking there oh, is yeah. something wrong with me. Oh my gosh, erectile dysfunction or vaginismus yeah. conditions where my body just isn't responding in the way that I had hoped and the movies portray. And so if we go down that negative shame spiral of what's wrong with me and navel gaze, yep then it makes it really hard to just emotionally reconnect. Are there things that couples can do to just ground each other while they're waiting for their physiology uh, to still be connecting in a way that helps prime and warm the body up for that interaction? Well, that's part of that anticipation time, mm -hmm. right? That's part of that. And, and that also means that as part of that anticipation time, there has to be something good to anticipate. And so you have to be able to communicate about like, well, this just doesn't do it for me, you know? And so I sort of feel like I'm doing my duty at, because I'm, I'm not experiencing the same thing that you are. And so that's the kind of thing that we, what we found is that the vast majority of couples, they care about each other. They actually statistically, it was fascinating, care more about their spouse's pleasure than their own. That was a really encouraging finding. Yeah. Um, and so like believing that about one another and being willing to raise things and say, you know, this just isn't working for me or whatever. Um, it is, it is essential as a mechanism for trying to overcome some of these disconnects that sometimes happen. Yeah. And are there ways that couples can practice intentionality ahead of time? So not just the physical act and the flirting, but also ways to emotionally connect in a deeper way. Because a lot oh, of times yes. I hear the, you just want sex and the other person's like, oh, I'm just trying to initiate and connect. And though you told me the thing, yeah. and you're kind of in a double bind. 
what are things that can kind of give permission to that space? Well, what you just said there is a really important dynamic. I should make sure that everybody knows that, again, this is, it is not always men, women, but it's very commonly men, women, mm -hmm. where um, for men, the actual act of sexual intimacy is one of the key ways that they feel physically connected, that they feel emotionally connected. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, all sorts of different uh, chemicals that are being released in the body, the different hormones. You know, everybody's heard of oxytocin, right? The bonding hormone. Sex for a man, that's one of the only times that oxytocin is released in that kind of quantity. Whereas for women, a bonding hormone, you could have that be released when you're having a good conversation with a friend mm -hmm. and you're feeling very close to that person. And so often it is very common that, you, let's just say stereotypical situation, husband's been away all week at a convention in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And so... He's missing his wife and he comes home and he wants to be intimate with her because he's feeling disconnected. She's thinking, you've been looking at all these showgirls in Las Vegas all week and you're just trying to, you know, have sort of the physical release and with other people in mind and that's no fun. As opposed to, no, there's actually two things going on. One is that he is, if he's a husband of goodwill, he's legitimately feeling disconnected from you emotionally and the sexual connection actually changes him to feel close to you emotionally. So like, that's a good thing. And for, but for him to know, oh, she's been feeling disconnected because you've been gone all week. She's been handling the kids. They've been running around. Like she is just, she was so eager for you to walk in that door so that she could go take two hours and take a bubble bath and do nothing or or so that the two of you could go out to dinner and really reconnect and talk. And then maybe <laughs> she'll feel a little more connected. And so the issue often is, is that for men, sex leads to a feeling of connection. Whereas for many women, they have to have the feeling of connection before they're interested in it. Mm -hmm. And so that dynamic is a um, super stereotypical, and there's a reason for it. It's very, very common. That's fascinating. So are you able to give us any more of those eight? I mean, I know it's a, a hook yes. it's by your book, but any more? No, of no, 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 absolutely. Well, it's going to be a while till it comes out. So yeah, one of the other things that, um, that to me was really interesting, another reason why people sometimes have the, um, the disconnect in, you know, somebody wants more frequency. Mm -hmm. than another and or I should say they have a difference in frequency mm -hmm. but one of the things that we found when we actually looked at the numbers is that in most marriages not not all but in most marriages nobody is getting as much sex as they want like everybody is wanting more than they're getting and I know, isn't that interesting? Oh. And so like, you know, the, you ask the average, I think the average um, woman, I would have to go back and look at the numbers, but like the average woman, I think wants sex a little over once a week, like not really twice a week. It's like a little bit more than once a week. And the average man, I think wanted sex a little bit more like one and a half to two times a week, two times a week, maybe. But the average amount of sex that is being had is lower than both of those. Yeah. And so the issue isn't, for most couples, the issue isn't, why aren't you having more sex? The mm -hmm. issue is, why aren't we? What's, what is it that's mm -hmm. getting in the way of both of us getting what we want? Yeah. And so that is like, that's huge because then suddenly you're not on opposite sides of the table, right? Mm -hmm. To use a counseling image, then you, you like, you can truly, you can put yourself on the same side of the table and sort of feel like, okay, what are we having to tackle together? Mm -hmm. What is it that's getting in the way? Why, you know, let's just say, for example, you know, spouse A wants sex twice a week, spouse B wants it four times a week, but they're having sex once a week. Mm -hmm. like there's some low hanging fruit there like what is it that's getting in the way is it 
schedules? Is it kids? Is it that you feel like you have to have the kitchen completely clean before you come to bed and then your spouse is asleep or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really encouraging. That's fascinating. Yeah, that yeah, was really that's the conversation of blame. Well, yeah. you don't prioritize me. You put the kids over me or your work is over me instead of putting us as a team going, okay, here's the situation versus you being the problem. We can now joint exactly. our together to create a solution. That's brilliant. It was, it was so, when we saw um, Dr. Seitzma and Jeff and I were pulling out the numbers and the graphs um, from when the survey results come in, because we do these massive nationally representative surveys that are incredibly expensive. And so we're all very nervous when we get the data. <laughs> like, I just spent $50,000 on this. I hope it's good. <laughs> you know, you know, I hope that I can learn something from this. And so we pulled up one of the, this chart that showed, you know, here's the, the line of what the husband wants. Here's what the wife wants. And here's what they're both having. It's like, whoa, wow. like that changes the dynamic like you said. Anyway, so another one that's a a little, um, another sneak peek that was fascinating to me is if another reason for, um, the whole book isn't just about this frequency mismatch, but it just happens to be the ones that I'm raising with you Hmm. um, because it's common, I guess. Another thing when there's a frequency mismatch, you know, when I said not, you're not, nobody's getting as much as they want the higher desire, the spouse that wants more tends to think that the lower desire person just doesn't have a sex as high of a sex drive, Mm -hmm. right? Like that tends to be the the assumption. And Mm -hmm. earlier we were talking about, well, no, there's two different kinds of desire. It just functions differently, Mm -hmm. but there's another technical reason, which is that it's not a sex desire problem. It's an initiation problem and that they're not seeing each other's signals for what they are and recognizing, no, this is an attempt to like spark intimacy or really common. I'm holding back and I'm not initiating because I'm worried that you're not going to say yes. Mm -hmm. And then I'll feel stupid and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like, no, you go first. No, you go first. (laughs) You know, it's like that kind of dynamic as opposed to just talking about it and saying, you know, I wish I didn't have to initiate so much because I would feel very desired if you initiated, Mm -hmm. but I recognize you have receptive desire. It's just not on your brain. And so it's kind of me going, okay, that means that I just, that's something that I need to see as kind of almost my, my role. Like Mm -hmm. it's not going to always be that, you know, every time, but it's not in there's no kind of um emotionally problematic thing that comes along with it it's not that i'm not desirable and that's why you're not initiating mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so recognizing that a lot of that is just signaling yes and and not seeing it one of the funniest <laughs> examples came from a couple that mike was counseling where they were really having trouble connecting. And one of the reasons that they discovered was this, that, you know, the initiation signals just weren't being sent or received well. And she was receptive desire. He was initiating desire. So they had that kind of stereotypical relationship. And Mike asked her, well, do you have any signals that you're, it's not that you're initiating, but that you're open. Mm. right like you could be feeling that tonight and and the husband goes no she doesn't ever signal and and she's like last night you were sitting watching the news and I put my hand on your knee and he's like that That was you initiating (laughs) what (laughs) and so that's an example of how silly is this how simple is it? Mm-hmm. And yet that's what we found with these eight things is these are all really simple things. There are bigger issues that get in the way, but we're, you know, we can only cover what affects sort of common, mm-hmm. a common situation for most people. 
Yeah. And I think it's so fun to be able to just have those conversations. Sometimes people are so emotionally laden by the time they have it, that it's more yeah. frustrating and it doesn't go well. But if we could have research, know that this is a basic normal thing, just a difference, and then write down, okay, what do I need to feel warmed up? And so then yeah. the person now writes that down and says, okay, then those are the ways that I'll lean in and then vice versa. Exactly. So if we just make it really practical and it's conversation instead of all the signals that we're mind reading and then <laughs> missing those mind reading signals, um, yep. so people are hurt and frustrated when we don't have to be, because a lot of times people do want to be happy and they want to have sex and they want to be uh, a good partner yep. or spouse. And yet, if we're not having those basic conversations and getting your book, she did not tell me, by the way, to promote her, but I believe in everything she does. So I will promote her. <laughs> When it comes out. Um, and then I would also say, I've worked with a lot of men that they think if you just give me sex, then I'll feel close to you. But a mm. lot of times emotionally, you may not be aware that you need that oxytocin from just yeah. conversation of being known and feeling safe. So that means on the female side, make sure that you're a safe place for him to take his armor off and that he can have his vulnerability and yeah. fears and failures and all of that. And he still feels like a hero. And he can feel known and seen without being criticized or mommed or fixed. Um, so many times we blame men for trying to fix women, but women do it as well because unconsciously we want that man to be, you know, put together and be strong. And, and sometimes he needs that oxytocin release from just saying today was really hard. Babe, can you tell me about it? And you're not multitasking with kids and cleaning the house and doing all these other tasks, but you slow down and actually hear his heart. Yeah. And and classically condition each other to lean into the opposite strength. And now we're getting oxytocin in both sides of the relationship on that connection emotion side oh. as well as the physical. Yeah, I love the way that you put that, Shannon. Truly. It the the thing that is so um challenging as I've looked at the research over for really honestly all my research ever since the beginning, ever since for women only which was what, 17, 18 years ago. It's not crazy. Um, it is it, this stuff isn't rocket science. There's so much that we care about each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vast majority of people, we care. We want to connect emotionally and sexually mm -hmm. every different way. We have this care for one another that says, I care about what you care about. And so I want to sort of be the person you need and we're trying really hard and we just don't realize sometimes we're trying hard in the wrong areas exactly. and, and it's so simple but we just don't know or we're hurting each other actually yeah. so that's even worse like to try really hard and then to actually realize you know you're hurting the other person and so that's why I'm so passionate about this stuff Mm -hmm. is because it's not rocket science. It is fairly simple in many cases to suddenly go, okay, now I know I can try hard and now I'm trying hard in the right areas. Yes. Yeah. And just going real quick back to attributions, I want to make sure that yeah. you know that just the basic question of, babe, when I do this, why do you think that I'm doing that? So an attribution just means the mind reading part of the why that I fill in. Yeah you're staying out late tonight because you don't love me or because you're stressed and trying to prove yourself and your work. And that's making you anxious and go into striving and performance. So if I can ask them, Hey babe, can you give me the reason that X behavior or X comment or X dynamic that now alleviates so much of what we automaticity, we just fill in the gaps of what we think the reason they're doing that. Of just making that moment of saying, oh gosh, I, I hadn't really even thought about it, or this is what I mean. And it's usually less nefarious than we've ascribed in our own mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. No, it's true. It's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And be careful of self-serving attributions, right? So that bias that if yeah. I do it, well, of course I need to because, and we give ourselves a pass while our spouse, on the other hand, is not getting the pass. And it's the worst attribution of why you're doing that. And yeah. how do you see that with couples when those attributions get haywire? Oh, I mean, that's actually one of the main things that brings down a marriage, yeah. right? Like one of the most 
um, dangerous things that we found, we've found in actually several studies is this concept of once you stop believing the best of your spouse's intentions towards you and you start getting into the, you are only doing that because Mm -hmm. someone told you to, or you, or you don't really mean that you just said it because what's next, whatever, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you don't care about me and the kids anymore. You care more about your work than me or, you know, a spouse, a husband who cares about intimacy has maybe a higher desire level. You know, she just doesn't desire me at all. You know, she'd rather um, be with the kids and with me, like all of those feelings are very understandable. And yet we have to, one of the things we found in a different research project on marriage that we did a number of years ago, is that we have to confront those and that the happiest couples um, tend to do that. That was one of the, the topics of the research is what is it that the happiest marriages do differently? And that was a big one. Okay, so I'm going to end here because we're going to do another episode and I want to hear more of your wisdom and jewels. Thank you so much, Monty, for being our guest today. And we will have links for your current books and hopefully we can help promote your future books and the research and literature. Everything that you're contributing to is amazing. We're so grateful. And the Unlock You community is a big fan. We love you guys and we'll see you for the next episode.